thank you. Uh, so the the goal of this uh, session is to discuss a bit about uh, the organization of uh, the way that we are handling security issues in Xorg uh, currently. As uh, I presented it yesterday, we are using the Xorg security mailing list, but maybe this needs to change or at least to be amended a bit to be more efficient. Uh, I have a, a number of points that uh, I want to try to, to discuss today. Uh, the, the first one is how to get new people involved with the process of uh, handling uh, new issues. Uh, there are a number of uh, issues currently waiting for someone to, uh, to, uh, to handle them on, on the mailing list. And as I said yesterday, waiting too long with embargoed issues is not a very good thing. So uh, since those issues, uh, at least uh, three of them are quite uh, easy to handle, I was expecting someone else to, to be able to handle them. And I didn't do anything. But this, this really doesn't uh, seem to be a working strategy. So um, I hope we can find a, a, a better one. The second point, uh, we will probably wait uh, a bit uh, to discuss it because uh, uh, I've asked uh, Benjamin to to come here um, to discuss, but he's currently presenting a talk, and the next uh, talk with uh, Martin is it's also something he's interested in, and I would have probably listen to that talk too, if I would not be there at the same time. But well, I will uh, look at the replay later. Um, but so, so we will wait for Benjamin to discuss uh, this, those issues. But basically, what I said uh, quickly in the, in the presentation yesterday is that um, there are some security issues that are already being handled uh, through GitLab private issues. but. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the if currently the, this is optimal because I don't really know who has uh, access to the private issues and uh, to for the vendors to prepare patches. Uh, I don't know if uh, they have access to the private issues if they get some notification that there is some security issue that is being tracked as a GitLab private issue and uh, I will the whole process of uh, um, preparing the, uh, the security advisory has been worked on in these cases. I've just discovered uh, one of those issues being handled this way recently. So, but this, has, this was also a, a source of uh, reflection for me earlier. Uh, for X server security issues, for example, we have been discussing patches on the mailing list rather than uh, opening a GitLab issue. And so the, for the X server maintainer, it's a bit uh, of, uh, of a problem because uh, he gets to, to listen and to, and to, to get some specific uh, way to test patches uh, since it can, they cannot be pushed to, the, to GitLab. Another thing that I wanted to discuss is if we need to keep the embargo for all the X server security issues, or if there are some categories of issues that can now be considered as not a security issue anymore, and that uh, for which we can tell to people, uh, well, uh, just open a regular uh, uh, GitLab issue with the with the bug, and it will be fixed. And probably, if there is a patch available, the patch may emerge even faster than going through the uh, through the whole uh, security uh, announcement process. Because most uh, most distributions currently ship X with the, with the X server running without any specific privilege, so it's basically just uh, a bug in an application. And the way for attackers, for outside uh, attackers to get data to the X server 
exploiting the, 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 uh, the bug, uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, often uh, really, really not uh, completely straightforward. straightforward and uh, maybe there are cases where we can say that clearly this has, this has no impact on security except for the few distributions that still ship X privileges, but they should really do something about this. And also there is some general work that still needs to be done on, uh, on X, even if uh, X is dying, it's not dead yet. And uh, it's probably going to be around uh, still for uh, at least uh, a couple of years or more. So it would also be great if uh, some people would volunteer either as uh, some off code projects or, or I don't know if you can get some money to sponsorize uh, the, those developments uh, to uh, to enhance uh, things, thing, fix uh, remaining bugs. Maybe well, I think one of the main thing that would help or, uh, reducing the number of bugs is to actually use uh, XCB to also generate the server side uh, uh, protocol coding and decoding. There are, uh, there are a lot of, to, uh, of things to be done there because the, the, the code on the server side is much more different uh, than on the Xlib side. And on Xlib, it was already quite hard to do the, the, the change, but at that time, there was a motivated team of people working on that. Nowadays, those people um, have mostly switched to other tasks, so we cannot count on the original Xlib developers to, uh, to do that. And the same goes for the, for the server side. Most of the people who developed the, this code on the server side are now gone. So uh, we, we really need new people. And maybe other ideas, there were a lot of uh, discussions about uh, using Rust. Uh, why not? Maybe we can implement uh, a code generator that generates Rust for the, uh, the protocol coding and decoding on the server side and uh, compile this part uh, using Rust. But it's going to be a, even more difficult on, uh, on some aspects to integrate it uh, in the various distributions, but uh, maybe it's uh, a solution and a way to also attract uh, more people. Uh, coding protocol coders, decoders in Rust may be more attractive than doing than doing it in C. So that's for the ideas. Uh, just. I see two people following the workshop on uh, GTC, but uh, just as a follow GTC, maybe you can just tell us who you are and why you are uh, here. Hey, it, it's Alan. Uh, been doing this with you for more years than I can keep track of now. And yeah, we need new people. Uh, we haven't really been reaching out to get them, but we need to start doing that somehow. Okay. Thanks. So... I don't know how to move on from there. Any? Any input? Maybe I should try. Well, one thing we haven't tried 
in a very long time is asking new people to join the list and help out. Um, yes. I don't know if we just want to put out a general call to like Xorg Devel or if we want to try recruiting specific people, but we need new people somehow and just waiting for them to show up and volunteer isn't working. Yeah, and I, I don't know how many people actually uh, attended the talk yesterday and got the message. So yes, maybe we can do a, a mail on XR level asking for help. And as I said, I wonder that I wonder if uh, moving to GitLab issues to actually report issues would be um, a good or not uh, a good move or not yeah um maybe you have more information than i do on how i know i see the issues when they're reported privately but i don't know who else does yes but for some of them i even don't see them and uh, uh, others, uh, I, can, I can see a few of them, but not all of them. And I know that uh, working uh, with uh, uh, Matt Turner uh, for the last uh, XR security, the, the X server uh, issues, he, he told me that he, he preferred to get the, the patches by email, but he didn't know really how it works. I don't know if since then he got more information. Yeah. Because that that may be a nice way to to handle the issue to to just move that to individual project maintainers, and they are they are responsible for handling this, and maybe we can we can get uh, some. Uh, um, some help uh, from uh, Benjamin to set up things uh, so that uh, people are packaging binaries uh, for the Linux distributions and for and for the BSDs and uh, get the uh, get the information in advance that there is a new release available and that it will be made public uh, at a given date. So I do see in GitLab that for the XOR group, I have the level of maintainer where you have developers. That may be why I see more than you do. Connect uh, since I cannot hear Denny. No, it, uh, it's uh, now I hear you. So, what was I going to say? Yeah. yeah. So, what I've noticed is that a lot is that some of the issues that I've reported haven't been fixed even after they uh, were just goes closed publicly. There was a CVE that I found in 2019, I disclosed in 2020. Yeah. Um, for yeah. local privilege escalation due to spoofing. 
Yes, this, this one is really complex. Uh, Keith Packard uh, did propose uh, a patch, but uh, no one uh, really knew how to move forward with this because it introduced a large incompatibility, I think. Can we, I think the best thing to do is to move the socket to a per user location. Yes, one of my question was if, uh, if there are any applications that don't use uh, Libx11 to, uh, to actually open the socket and that would uh, get into trouble, but I don't know if it's the case. Uh, no, at the, uh, only one I'm, only one I'm aware there, let's see there, I think there's a pure, there may be a pure Rust client, but that would be easy to patch. Okay. Well, that's definitely something uh, that needs to to be put on, on uh, somehow back on the table and that we, uh, we uh, that needs to move forward. One of the issues is that, as I said uh, in previous emails to XR security and also said yesterday is that I have less and less time to actually work on those aspects. And even just coordinating releases gets a bit difficult for me. But uh, I can try to, uh, to find ways to, to slowly move forward. There is also an issue between uh, that it needs co uh, coordination between X server and libraries or releases, and that needs to be handled correctly by package managers. Because once you have installed a new library that will look for the for the socket somewhere else, it will fail to connect to, to the currently running server. Or we need a transition period where the library is uh, looking at both uh, faces. I think, yes. go ahead. As you say, it's also going to cause a problem for anyone who has statically linked libraries, but I'm not sure can we say much we, about that. Can we just say we don't support that case? <sighs> because Certainly for libx11, there, you, if you are purely statically linked, you lose a lot of stuff like input methods and uh, other loadable objects. Um, because I think... Like when it comes to when it comes to the spoofing issue, the the only other solution I could think of required each client to implement some sort of the server authentication logic based on UIDs. Right. And I wasn't really sure if that was viable. So I think moving the socket's probably the best thing to do, but that does mean that there needs to be a place to put it. And given that home directory past can be very long, that really needs, that means that that slash run slash user slash UID needs to exist. And on OpenBSD, I don't think it does by default. No, but we can create uh, it. systems like OpenBSD except perhaps for the acceptance by other developers are um, not that difficult to handle because it's really monolithic. And if we change, if we decide to, to change something, we can change it in the base system and in the X library at the same time. For me, Linux distributions uh, are more difficult because uh, they, uh, they assemble parts coming from different uh, maintainers. And I think, I think, uh, so, a thought I had was have was ship out a new X X server slash X display manager slash display manager whatever pa packages and also ship out new client libraries and have the de package dependencies be such that the new version of the server depends on the new client libraries and vice versa. So upgrading either requires upgrading both. Yes, but still, if you upgrade the live running system, you will break uh, the, the libraries. Once they are installed, they cannot connect to the running server anymore. True. That is true. So I guess for system control restart, 
display manager service or whatever it is yeah. in a post install script. Some some distributions have moved to a Windows like uh, upgrade system where the the upgrade are only installed part of a shutdown and reboot process. Yeah. And Solaris with the boot environment, so it's not an issue. Your upgrade. Another. Yeah, but otherwise, I think I think the best thing that could be done is just restart X in the post and scripts. Right. Yeah, on Solaris, we just force it to happen in a new boot environment, and then it'll come up after you reboot anyway. It won't affect the running system. Yeah. For... Fedora, I think, tries to use offline updates. Um, I have very little experience with them because in CubesOS, they don't work for various Cube-specific reasons. So other, other than... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was I thinking? But yes, I think I think the best thing to do is just restart the X server once the upgrade is completed. That will that'll terminate all. That'll cause X clients to terminate and. When the when the, when the user restarts them, they'll come up with the fixed libraries will be working. Thoughts? It's not something we can truly control from the Xorg side. We can just advise the distros on how to package it, but. Like I, yeah. I, I think, I think that's like the only reasonable option from what I can tell because an incompatible change has to be made. Yes, at least since the issue is already public, and this is the kind of things where we can discuss patches publicly on the on the X server uh, GitLab and uh, the X the Linux eleven GitLab and publish a branch or something with the with the code so that uh, people can actually try it. And, Wait. and figure out the best way to integrate the, the data on the distributions. Uh, Wait, don't... actually, better idea. Yes. Have it so that, so if, if changing the format of, so one of the patches that I think Alan Coopersmith has proposed is to allow specifying an absolute path to the socket. So that change on the client is backwards compatible. So upgrade the client li so upgrade the client libraries and then then change the display then upgrade the display manager so that the display manager puts the new socket in the new path. And then later, and then a while later uh, change the meaning of colon zero and such. I don't remember writing that patch. That must have been one of Keith's proposals, but or remove. I forget if it was you or Keith Packard. Yeah. Sorry, it's but okay. it it is on 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 the Git on GitLab. Also, abstract socket support on Linux on the client needs to go. I have a MR for that. Because those are fundamentally un unauthenticatable. Can that be reviewed? Probably. As I said, the, the advantage of this is that since it's already public, it's not really an uh, XR security only problem. OK, yeah. I, I, I think the, unfortunately, it falls into the other problem X has, which is that 
there's just no one reviewing stuff that's and the X server gets attention, but the rest of the apps and libraries really don't. Yeah, but at least if we tell people, uh, well, uh, this change into the X server also requires a change to the uh, X11 lib, and then people uh, and XCB, and then people will uh, at least uh, if they want to test it, they will be uh, they will be required to also uh, fetch the, the branches from. And, and test those. And yeah, okay. I, I don't I don't know how many people have notifications turned on to know that there's a patch for this waiting out in libxtrans. Um, we may just need to start poking people on the Xorg Devel IRC or mailing list to say, hey, this is in GitLab to be reviewed. Yes, that was a that, that's the role that I was thinking about for us is just to work Can, with could Xorg security unilaterally merge the patch? Um, the list? No, like, as... as, as I'm, I as, mean, I can. I, I, I have powers to merge patches in any of the X components. Um, Matthew should. Yes. Um, but normally for the X server, there is a maintainer and uh, the merge should, should go through right. the maintainer. Okay. It, I've been reluctant to merge that patch because I don't work on a Linux distro. It doesn't affect me. I can't test it. Yeah, I can merge it and see if anyone complains. Um, I was hoping someone like Ajax who works on a Linux would take a, uh, a look at it, but... Uh, I think it. There's I a mean, certain point, of, you know, it's been out there for almost a year now. I think it's probably just best to go ahead and merge it and see if anyone complains. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, it shouldn't cause regressions. And the abstract sockets patch that I come up, I put out, should be similar. I don't think it should cause any regressions in practice because all the servers also list on the named socket. I don't remember when this was uh, added, this, if it was for some system D integration. Or, no. Or if it's just someone who said, well, we have this abstract uh, socket, uh, why not support them in X? I don't remember. I think it, it, theoretically it could cause some sort of issues with certain container, container setups. That's the main catch. But given the... Yeah, the, given the I thought it was just someone who is trying to avoid, oh, writing a socket in temp is insecure. It'll be less of a problem if we use this abstract namespace instead without realizing like, I, that it caused other issues instead. Like I think it I think it's probably just I I think it's just best to go ahead and merge it and see if anyone complains because I don't know. But then I'm also known for someone who is very heavy on C and I at the expense of A. So that's me saying I have my own biases. All right. So, but like, I think it's probably best to, I don't know. Maybe let's talk about this later because it's not. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yes. So this is one issue that well we should move forward, but there is nothing blocking. The other issue that you mentioned uh, yesterday, so they are also almost public now. Are the the issues in the uh, XCB client side? I also told that uh, just before releasing the the last uh, Linux 11 patches is that uh, I wrote patches for Linux 11, but I saw that clearly the same kind of issues were existing in Linux CB. And for this, I don't know how to move forward. 
uh, if someone has ideas on how to to patch the code generator to to add more checks there, or if we need to dive into this code to, uh, to figure it out by our, ourselves. I'm as far as the existing code generator in Python, I don't have any. I'm not. I'm not sure. However, I do know there is X11RB, which is X11 Rust bindings, and it does generate. And the code it generates does have those checks. Um, now that code is obviously in Rust, but I think it could even if libxcb can't include Rust components, I imagine that the generator could be like the, the logic in the generator could still be used. And also I'm not sure if a build time if a build time dependency on Rust is okay, then the then the generator could be ported to generate C code. But if not, then the logic should be a good idea of how to do this. Yes, yes, I think the, the way to go is to first try to manually patch the generated C code to see what needs to be changed to the generated code, and then figure out where in the generator okay. you did this. I think, yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a professional Python developer, but I think I know enough of Python to figure out how to modify the, the generator when I know once I know exactly uh, where the, uh, the extra checks uh, should be added. And for this, okay. um, someone should uh, look at the generated C code. Normally, I have, I have an idea of how of what of one way to fix the generated C code. There's obviously several. Okay, I, I've not looked at it, but normally, as far as I remember, one of the goal of uh, XCB generator was to produce somehow readable code. So it should be. Yeah, it's yeah. Should it should be possible to to actually figure out how to patch the generated code on an example, yeah. and then uh, 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 retro engineer that uh, into the generator. My my idea was to basically generate check versions of the size of and of the size of functions and the iterator and the iterator routines that take a, a length argument. And return an error if the if there's not enough space in the buffer. Actually, probably instead of a length argument, it'd be better for them to take an end pointer. Trying to write down what we're saying. And also, there's some changes that need to be made in libxcb and like libxcb itself, like the C parts. But those are much easier. Yes. And there's a change needed to add a check to make sure that at the very least the server sent enough bytes to fill the reply struct. But that's also, but that's an easy change to make in the generator, and I've already done it. Okay. So I can help with that. If you can deal with the hard part is fixing up the generator. But I can I can show you how to, yes. I can come up with ideas for what the generated code should look like. Yes, I think that if we have that, then it's uh, probably not that hard to fix the generator. OK. So I just wanted to check where the, where the other talks are. Okay, Benjamin is finishing his talk, and then there is still the talk by Martin. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know if uh, anyone, Demi or someone else, is motivated by trying to also uh, start working on converting the X server side to to generated code. I would be. It's something that I would find personally very interesting. It is not something that I am at all likely to have time for because my time is yeah, that's basically it. taken by Cube's work. I think obviously, fi obviously fixing the security issues on the client side is a prerequisite to using it on the server side because otherwise we would have a security regression. I, th I think... Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We, we have a mix server release coming soonish. This one is not going to be fixed for this. And I don't even know if the pending issues that were reported is going to be part of this release or if it's going to be a separate release. I think that uh, it would be. The, Switching to generated code would definitely close this kind of issues. And then the server could mostly be considered as uh, complete from the security point of view because we got rid of most of the font parsing issues since everything is done by free type. So this is outside of our scope. Can, is there a way we can turn off? Can some features of X of of X just be turned off by default? I'm thinking specifically byte swapped clients. Uh, maybe even maybe even parts of the core protocol nobody uses. Well, that's a good question. It's true that since most of the clients are local nowadays, all the swapping code is mostly unused. Yeah. I have yeah. To wondering about just turning off byte swapping support if you're running on local sockets only because technically you can still enable it if you write a custom client to go into via the swapped paths are there but there's no there's no real reason you should be able to it's it's there you can but why I seem to remember there was something about PowerPC or Power where there were, which had something, it was some sort of built by Indian processor. I know there have been processors where you can choose the Indian depending on, you know, which OS you're running, but I don't remember any that let you switch on the, to have some applications running big Indian and some small. Um, I think. I think there was something with KV, something with something, something, somebody was running. I don't know. I just remember seeing a bug report about that because someone pointed me to it. I it think certainly it was, seems like something we could turn off by default. And, you know, if you're running on a by Indian power PC platform, well, then you have to compile it in. Yeah, maybe yeah. At, the time, at the time where Apple switched from power PC to Intel. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the, I know the, what it was. The, the emulator was uh, probably running Intel and uh, Little Indian and Power PC code and Big Indian. Yeah, that that would make sense if you're oh, running an emulated think, Power okay. PC client on an x86 processor. Or I think this, yeah, I think this particular one was actually, which I'm call it. Oh yeah, I think this had something to do with KVM. I think somebody was running a little Indian or a, a big Indian KVM guest on a little Indian host or vice versa or something on power. And somehow they got shim working because the bug was that byte swapping and MIT SHM didn't work or something like that. I mean, I know on Solaris, our builds would leave the, the byte swapping support enabled because we have a lot of, I mean, our customers, they'll try to run a Spark application displayed, displayed remotely to an x86 desktop or laptop, and yeah, we get bug reports on that. But also, that's not, that's not the case for 90% of Linux users. 
Oh, also the other thing is even if it's compiled in, I imagine it would be very easy to turn it off, make it controlled by a flag at runtime. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, just like was done with it, GLX, if I remember correctly. Yeah, as you say, GLX indirect. If the code is implemented correctly, which is always a big if in the X server, then it I should it be a, a simple a simple check to uh, reject selecting the big Indian. The sorry, the Indian swapping mode is done in the connection setup code. So, you know, just a simple check there to say, oh, if you request Indian swapping, we just say, no, you're not going to connect. Should be simple. Yeah. Also, I have some, uh, as far as other improvements, I have a documentation MR improvement for, am I, for XCB. Uh, and... What was it? Oh, yeah. And yeah, you've just seen that in general, there's few people reviewing XCBMRs since. Oh, yeah. And also, this, this was an XCB Proto one, right. but also the extended SHM attach MR and the server termination extension. Yeah, I've not heard it. Not uh, too closely, but uh, yes. Um. Ironically, the original authors of XCB are all off doing Rust stuff now instead. <laughs> I find that hilarious, but awesome. I mean, using Rust, I mean, I think probably from my perspective, probably the single biggest, imp one of the really awesome improvement for X would be um, sandbox X Wayland. And by that, I mean that if you have something like Flatpak, have the have X Wayland run in the context of the Flatpak sandbox, and the compositor connects to each X Wayland, Wayland compositor connects to each X Wayland instance separately. And that way, Flatpaks that rely on X11 don't can do so without losing sandboxing. Honestly, I don't know enough about uh, x Wayland to, to actually see what would be involved to do that. But from the few things that I know about it, it's, it looks like it's possible. But uh... well, so I see that uh, Benjamin joined. I don't know if you are available or if you, if you are still listening to Martin Talks. I'm trying to do both, but I guess it would be hard to follow both at the same time. No, but then uh, we will let you finish listening to Martin Talks. And we well, I'll, I'll be able to, to look at routing later if, if, if need be. Okay. So. Because because it really looks like uh, we need to discuss about uh, how the private uh, issues in GitLab are handled uh, when it's security issues. Uh, if, is it possible to get up to the um, uh, to the security advisory and to get a CID and all this through the private issues, or if we need some mechanism to bridge between both? Okay, <laughs> not sure I have the answers for that, but <laughs> can try to. Um... No, but th there are a few things. For example, I uh, I don't know who exactly has uh, access to private issues currently. It's all the the XOR organization members, or it's fi uh, final grain. It's it depends on the project you're looking at. Um, I. Don't know exactly. Uh, I think private issues are probably, uh, at least for the maintainers of the projects. Uh, well, CSAT means are 
separate bits uh, because uh, so whenever somebody has sysadmin profile, uh, we can see anything on yeah. the cluster, on the, on the GitLab server, which means that uh, even if I'm not part of the security advisory team, I would have access to those. Um, private issue. mailing list, basically. Yeah, yeah, that would be the same. Um, regarding private issues, I think they are at least for the maintainers, um, but they should be, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, it's for, uh, let me try to open it to create a new issue because I'm pretty sure that there is a, so yeah. they say that this issue is confidential and should be only visible to team members with at least reporter access. So that means that uh, anybody who is a developer and is a reporter would have access to the, to the, to the issue. Okay, so it's quite wide. So reporters, anyone who can file a bug, so anyone? Uh, no, reporters is something um, in the middle. Uh, okay. I think reporter doesn't matter much in a public project uh, because, of course, you can file bugs whenever you want. But if it's a private project, then you can have reporters who have access to the project, can pull the project, but they cannot participate in a project like a developer can. I think that that's the difference. Um, however, what you can do and what we what we do within Red Hat uh, for this kind of stuff is you can always have a separate group for the security advisory board. And we can request people to open issues there and have only a few set of people uh, to, to have access to those uh, issues. It's maybe not the best, but at least that would give you a private space where you can actually discuss with people without having to rely on a mailing list. Yeah, the, for, for me, one of the issues is to get a way to have the, the binary distribution maintainers uh, aware of the security issues and to get them access to the patches. And uh, so one, if, if you if we switch to testing, yes, can people hear me? Yes. Okay, just checking. For me, one of the questions is if we continue uh, we using an uh, email-based uh, uh, workflow for, uh, for the patches and to test the patches, or if it's possible to switch to actually create some private branches and uh, have the patches there, and that at some point, just merge the, the private branch uh, to the main branch and do the release when the, the, the bug goes public. And, uh, and if so, how to give uh, package maintainers uh, the access to the private branch so that they can prepare the, the binary packages in advance? Because I think that currently this is what they are doing, but I don't really know. I've mean, never worked uh, with Canonical or Red Hat or anyone on, on those. For the OpenBSD side, I know that uh, I do apply the patches uh, to a private tree and uh, I just merge them to the official uh, public XR3 when the, the, the bug uh, becomes public. And then only after that, uh, the people who build the, the binary packages for OpenBSD build them from the, what was committed to, to CVS. But for, the, for other projects, I don't know if they uh, wait for the public release to rebuild their packages or if, they, or if they start building from a private tree where the patch was already applied. Um, it's going to be tough to do with GitLab, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, time so to make, uh, yeah, time to patch. I was going to suggest patching GitLab like making an upstream MR for them because open source. Good luck with that. <laughs> Not mentioning because I mean, uh, this needs this needs some very deep change in everything. Uh, right now, I'm not even sure that you can open a merge request that would be private. Uh, this is something we'd have to check. 
um, but having a um, private merge request seems to be pretty much conflicting with the way the merge request is exposed by uh, GitLab right now. Right now, whenever you open a merge request, the branch gets actually included in the main tree, in the master tree, in the origin tree. And whenever you, if you just pull the origin tree, you're able to look at all of the merge requests that are there. So basically, if you create private merge requests, I'm not sure you would be able to have those final grain access. So that's going to be a little bit complex to do. Um, we are starting to use GitLab internally at uh, Red Hat. Uh, it's not a, uh, it's not news. I think uh, we already advertised that in Linux Plumber, or at least we will explain that uh, next week in Linux Plumber. Uh, for all of those CVEs, um, what we're going to have is we're going to have some separate private trees on GitLab uh, that would have all of the people that needs, I mean, for the very embargoed one, the one that where only people need to know, like a Spectre on Meltdown, uh, they would have, we would create a special tree for them, uh, include all of the people that needs to have access to that. And then we would basically create a merge request or directly merge the result into the main tree uh, when it goes public. So that's not so much different to what we are doing right now with a private branch, with a private tree. Uh, but I don't think uh, GitLab would solve all of these there. We can always request them uh, to do this kind of stuff, but it, it seems like it's it very much um, the, the low level part of GitLab are very, very uh, um, not toward this goal. Okay, so we would need to maintain a, a separate uh, project for, so, uh, for the um, the repositories with security issues and work there and just create the network request when it goes public. I, I think that would be the easiest. That would be the, the, the thing that you can do right now. So yeah, you create a like either under free desktop or under we can create a group like uh, XORG security board. You can clone every project you want there. You can include the the the, the match request for, for the C V E. You can have a discussion with the with the people involved in there. And um, and then you can you can release the the tree there when I mean you can release you can you can yes. publish the merge request. And then the issue is to figure out how to move uh, private issues from the main repository to this repository. Yeah, you can do that really easily with uh, with GitLab. You can move the the issues, so that's. Uh, yeah, that's that's a one way of doing it. Okay, nice. Then. So yes, then we will just need to prod the, the vendors present on uh, XR security to check with them if uh, this way of uh, uh, preparing the patches uh, would fit their their current workflow. Yeah, and what I would even suggest, I mean, if you have if you have the regular CVEs. That the ones like there is a buffer overflow and this kind of stuff. Well, you can just use one generic project, but if you have one very um, kind of not difficult, uh, but the ones that that do not need to get out of a handful of people, uh, you just create a specific project for that particular CVE that you name it like, uh, I don't know, XKB uh, dash uh, CVE or something. Yeah. You can open to how many people you, you want. Like for instance, if you want to share the patch with Red Hat or with Suzy with OpenPSD, you can open those people, you can invite them to be part of this project. So they would have access to just this particular bug. But whenever the, the CVE is done, then you just keep the project and because and those people won't have access to, to this anymore. Yes, yes, that's nice too. Okay, so uh, yeah, still uh, we have some ideas on how to, uh, to move forward and maybe at some point we will uh, we'll see if it's possible to uh, move the, because currently 
one of the things that I'm a bit worried about is that uh, all the traditional uh, X server and libraries uh, that report to go to the X org security main list. Because as, as I said yesterday, uh, we uh, we never see any issues concerning Wayland, uh, the, the library Western uh, WA root and so on. Uh, are there no issues, or are they just handled uh, somewhere else? Uh, I I'm, I can actually speak to that one. I filed two, I found two vulnerabilities in Wayland's, Lib Wayland server recently. They're both still embargoed, so I'm not going to mention what they are, but I will say that I filed them both as confidential issues on GitLab because I couldn't think of a better, better place to do it. Okay, so they are not directly by the maintainers? I assume so. As I said, I did that because there was... There was not an obvious security. There wasn't any sort of information as to what 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 else to do. But I think like that that was the best idea I could come I could come up with at the time because I there wasn't any sort of oh, yeah, information I, that said please send security issues to X. Yeah, really. They should have something like that, but yeah, we knew something was going on because there. we knew something was going on because the Wayland developers asked us how to get a CVE ID assigned. But yeah, yeah XORG security doesn't know the details, just that they have a CVE ID. Yeah, that, that's just uh, yeah. They're just uh, if sorry. Like if 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 such things should instead be sent to Xorg security, I guess the answer is that needs to be documented in the Wayland in like a security.md file or something in the in the Wayland repos. Yeah, first we need to agree with the maintainers of uh, the, the various Wayland library. And this, uh, this makes me realize that I forgot to regenerate my, uh, my slide with the topics because one of the topics that I added uh, uh, just uh, before starting the, the workshop is that uh, is the documentation topic. Uh, we need to update the wiki about the procedures. And uh, maybe, uh, and also, for example, in the in the procedure that is documented in the wiki, we update the wiki whenever uh, an, an advisory is uh, produced. Um, but I don't know who is still able to to edit the, the, the old wiki. Alan and myself, for sure, we are able to do that. But I don't know about uh, any new maintainers, uh, even the. The current X server maintainer, I'm not sure if he has access to the, uh, to the wiki. And so. Are you talking about the the, the general XORG wiki? Or yes. the, uh, the specific one for the. No, the general XORG wiki. So everybody who, who still has SSH access to the, to the old server uh, should be able to have the wiki there. Um, the, the, the one thing that the Nouveau project did uh, previously was to uh, migrate their wiki that was hosted on uh, XORG, I think, uh, to a GitLab pages environment, uh, which allow everybody to contribute in a, with merge requests and all this kind of stuff way more easily. So maybe that's something you can actually uh, bootstrap or request us to, to, to do. And the idea is just that we, we would host the wiki instead of using the, the old uh, Wiki wiki or whatever it is, uh, as a GitLab page. Yes, I think this is already uh, noted somewhere that uh, on a to do list. Maybe since what since when? But certainly, if we're setting up an XORG security group in GitLab for this, we should be able to have a. Wiki sub project under there. Or a wiki replacement GitLab pages sub project. Yeah, and you can even have a, we can even very easily create a, a DNS entry like security.x.talk or something like that, or security.freestop.talk. 
uh, that would point at your wiki. So it would be very easy to do. Also, I think there's a there's a dot well known for security for security contacts. Yeah. I'm not sure how widely it's used, but uh, yes, that does exist. All right. And given how poorly we're doing at keeping up with just the XORG security issues, I'm not sure if we want to take on Wayland and everything else on freedesktop.org, but we should certainly encourage them to document right. how security issues should be reported to those projects yes. so people don't have to guess. Yeah, I don't want to have to handle all those. It's just that it, it should be documented how they are handled and uh, to make sure that uh, the, all the maintainers have uh, a few ideas and have the pointer to the, to the list of uh, the, the checklist of what needs to be done whenever a security issue is reported. If they already know all of this because they are also maintaining other projects, then it's perfectly fine. But if uh, they are uh, newcomers and, and need some assistance, and then we can help them a bit with that. We have, we have a number of documents already written. So, I think we basically covered all the topics that I had in mind. I don't know if someone wants to add something or... I think, I think for Rust, I think given the state of the general state of X and how the odds of making huge, very large changes to X are very low, I mean, using Rust and X would be great, but I also think it's that would also be a very large change, and I don't really see it happening with the current amount of labor. I think something that'd be more likely to be viable would be using Rust in Wayland compositors. And I'm thinking specifically in either LibWayland server or especially like WO roots because that seems to be where most like most it seems that most compositors are using WO roots as their underlying library. Yes, yes, that's probably more likely to happen in the in the next future. Uh, I was mentioning uh, Rust in the Xcode. As a possible way, perhaps, to attract uh, new people, saying, well, the, here the, the, there is an existing code base that uh, would be fun to, to convert to, uh, to Rust. If you want to help, uh, welcome and, and see what uh, comes out of this. Most of the system that I know should be able to use some Rust at some point. Yesterday, I heard that uh, Lisa is considering starting using Rust. So, for example, for OpenBSD, this will uh, cause some issues. But if we fix the, if we if we manage to either get a Rust in base or have a, uh, or move the Xenokara to port, then the issue is uh, fixed. And the moving Xenokara in ports is something that I'm considering for some time now. I have some working prototypes, so it's not really complicated. I was going to say, I'd, I'd love to see Rust and OpenBSD base, but that's completely off topic. Right. Yes, someone that, that's private, but uh, there are some people who have made some demonstration that it's not that difficult, even in the kernel. But certainly as Firefox and GNOME already require Rust, if you yeah. are actually running an X desktop, you probably already have some support for it. Yeah, Libor SVG requires it. And right. Yes. Most everything requires Libor SVG. And yeah. uh, SVG is still, is, is still able to build the old uh, C code when OS is not available. But, uh, 
but yes, more in most of the systems uh, and, and on most of the architectures, we already have uh, a full OS support. Just uh, risk, risk uh, is not yet ready. On, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see Rust in libxml2, not least because that would make, not least because that would require its use in, that would require that would make Rust a dependency of DNF, and I want to see Rust in DNF for other reasons, but anyway, that's, that's again, totally off topic, so. I think, I think Rust in X would, like Rustifying X, I think it would be, it would be an interesting project, but I also think that it might very well Take away time that could be better spent on event on deprecating X and transitioning projects away from it. Yes, that's that's a trade-off. If... Because I I think I think ultimately X needs to at some point be officially deprecated, like X eleven. Yes, that's. We can say that there is no more new development, but uh, and the support for X11 is uh, still going to run for a number of years, just because uh, companies like Red Hat uh, uh, have some contractual needs to support uh, X for uh, the next. Uh, I don't know how many years as part of the project. The problem isn't when all the desktops are fully Wayland, it's when everybody's custom applications that they've been running for 20 years internally are all converted. Hence why I was thinking of the like sandboxed X Wayland kind of thing, yeah. or like isolated X. Like if, if somehow X Wayland could be made a sidecar of some sort so that it's a so, so that it's Like ideally, perhaps this is like really far off, but maybe it could even be embedded into XCB and or XLib. That would be like a totally weird idea, but. Well, I think there were some projects like that on the, uh, where they got rid of the giant server part and we try to build uh, X application that were directly running, but I don't remember if it's for Android or, or what. It was far from complete, of course. Yeah. Because the half, the half part there is the, the array. Currently, the there are two protocols in every X application, the, the X11 socket and, uh, and the DRI. There's also Kate, the issue that X clients expect information that Wayland simply does not provide. Well, Anyways, I think we will try to write down some small projects for the summer of code or, or the XORG coding projects, which I forgot the name of the evoke. Well, I remember evoke, but I don't remember what it means. Uh, projects so that if, if there are students somewhere who would like to play with uh, rewriting parts of uh, X in Rust, they can play with that. The XCB project started a bit like that. It was uh, some university projects that uh, ended up uh, being included in the, the, the main X code. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we've had the uh, converting the server side to XCB in the project ideas list for a decade and no one's ever yeah. 
jumped on it. Um, this is why I, I was thinking that maybe uh, adding some more rust on top of it would, uh, would attract uh, new people. Yeah. So I think uh, we, we are done for this workshop. Again, unless someone wants to add something, we still have uh, some time if uh, if we are more if there are more topics to discuss. But for what I had in mind, uh, with mainly discussed what uh, what I wanted to discuss. I, uh, a bit sad that there were, that there was no more participation, but uh, I was somehow expecting that. Thanks, everyone, for coming.